Bruchem Aboim. Welcome everyone to our home. And um, this week again will be a, uh, a continuation again of last week's lecture of what was it, what exactly was their sin. So again, talking about the Jews in the desert again with the incident of the golden calf. So this week on my thoughts, I would like to continue our examination as to what was it about the incident of the golden calf that was so grievous that God Almighty threatened to destroy the whole Jewish nation. The desert experience was orchestrated by God as a sort of institution of higher learning for the founders of our nation. God was instructing them, guiding them on a path that they and their descendants would follow for eternity. I believe that the whole desert experience was part of God's plan to impress upon the nation at its inception that there are consequences for your actions. If you sin, then you will be punished. However, this immediate response was unique to the desert experience. God, as our loving parent, wanted us to know that he loves us and that he is in attendance. He cares. He cares enough to administer tough love whenever he deems it necessary. You know, we read in the portion of Bo that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they numbered Kishesh Meos Eleph like 600,000 men. They were between the ages of 20 to 60. The Torah does not mention any real specific number, only that they numbered more than 600,000. Our sages tell us that in order for the redemption of Egypt to have occurred, it was necessary for there to be a minimum of 600,000 men between the ages of 20 to 60. You know, I believe that the extra number of men alluded to by the extra letter Kuf were the walking dead. By that I mean that those men should have died in Egypt during the days of darkness, when four-fifths of the Jews perished. Now, we do read that there were certain individuals who should have died during the days of darkness, who did survive. They may well have been the worst of the worst, such as Dustin and Avira, two individuals who were so evil that they didn't even deserve to experience a normal death and burial. Instead, they were swallowed up and taken directly into purgatory alive. So at least some of those men, over the required 600,000, did not actually die peacefully in the land of Egypt. They were brought out by God Almighty to die a sort of sacrificial death in the desert. When the Torah describes in the portion of Kisisa, in reference to those who were killed and for the sin of worshiping the golden calf, it writes there, Kishloshis Elif Ish, like 3,000 men. There are different opinions given by the commentaries as to why it says Kit, like 3,000. So was it 3,000 or wasn't it? I believe that this extra letter Kuf alludes to the fact that though these men who died in the sin of the golden calf were in reality on death row, even before they left Egypt. The reason that God took these extra men out from Egypt may well have been to serve as visual proof that he is in attendance. He wanted to impress upon the nation at its inception that there are consequences for one's actions. God cares. People sinned, and the nation was able to witness that they were punished for their transgression. Yet, God did not kill out the members of the tribe of Don, those who served the idol, Pesel Micha. God went even further. Amalek had attacked those members from the tribe of Don who were worshiping the idol. They had been refused entry into the camp by the clouds of glory, which made them vulnerable to attack by Amalek. God told Moshe to command Yeshua to choose 1,000 righteous men from each of the tribes to go out and battle against Amalek. We see that God as a benevolent father wants to destroy the sin, not the sinner. His hope is always to instruct and not punish. There is a saying in Hebrew, Ein Shmiya Korea, that hearing something is not the same as seeing something. Again, God was trying to make a deep and lasting impression 
while the nation was still in its formative years in the desert. So we see that only these 3,000 men participated in the sin of the golden calf, along with the heir of Rab, the mixed multitude of Egyptians that Moshe took out. The measure states that only one man, one man protested their actions. Only he stood up against the idol worshippers, and it cost him his life. That was Hur, the son of Miriam. Why didn't anyone else try to stop the sinners from worshipping the calf? So on a very practical level, we find in the portion of Bishalom, there the Torah states that when the Jewish nation left Egypt, they were chamushim, which means armed. Rashi states that the word can also be read chamishim, meaning one-fifth, which Rashi interprets to mean that only one-fifth of the Jewish nation actually left Egypt. The rest, four-fifths, died during the days of darkness. There is a Zohar that states that the word Chamishim alludes to the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude who were one-fifth of the number of the children of Israel. They would then have numbered about 125,000. In addition, those Jews who left Egypt were bricklayers. They knew nothing about warfare or, or how to use a weapon. One also to take into consideration that just three months prior to this event, they were slaves in Egypt. And these same men, the Erev Rav, were their masters. As the Rambam states, that they were a slave nation with a slave mentality. This was a nation that had been born into slavery. It was all that they had ever known. They had also been steeped in idol worship. Uh, it was a way of the land. It, it, was, it was not something out of the norm. In an open confrontation, the Jews would have been easily overpowered by the worshippers of the calf. Now, even the tribe of Levi, who may well have known something about using weapons, were highly outnumbered. So even they couldn't have been held culpable for not trying to stop the idol worship that they were witnessing. But still, there had to be some sort of culpability. The question becomes, for, but for what? Their sin may well have been not that they served the idol. Their sin may well have been that they derived some sort of enjoyment from watching those who served it. After all, we are referring to a nation who had just experienced a revelation of God that was so sublime that it caused their souls to leave their bodies, and they died. They experienced this revelation not once, but twice. We read in the portion of Kisisa that Moshe asked to see God. God replied, Ki lo yir ani ha'adam v'chai that no man can see me and live, as was attested to at the giving of the Torah. There, the nation experienced some form of divine revelation of God, and they all died. In addition, they had been nurtured on a diet of mun, that spiritual food that came from heaven, for the last 60 days. The consumption of the spiritual food in conjunction with their revelation of Mount Sinai should have elevated their thoughts and their minds to a much loftier level. You know, I often tell people that when we as Baal Tshuvas, returning Jews, drive down the street and we happen to see a billboard that's advertising suntan lotion, they often show an attractive woman wearing a bikini. We gaze and we think to ourselves, if we think at all, that she is an attractive woman. No big deal. So when the rabbi drives down that same street and sees that same billboard, well, his reaction is not the same as ours. It is totally different. He is appalled. He questions how they are permitted to put an indecent picture on a billboard for the public to view. That may have been what God saw as their transgression. After their divine revelation at Mount Sinai, how could there still have existed any place in their minds or hearts the possibility of enjoying even virtually Someone else worshipping an idol. They should have found the act repulsive. They didn't. And for that, on their elevated spiritual level, they were held culpable. You know, it was much easier for Moshe to take the Jews out of Egypt than to take Egypt out of the Jews. I often call Bali Chuva repentant individuals, lion tamers. Once you've tasted from some forbidden pleasures of life, it is difficult, if not impossible, 
to rid yourself completely of those desires, the lions. Only one man found the act unacceptable, and he acted, and he died. The, re the nation watched, and instead of outrage, the nation froze. There may well have been different reasons as to why certain individuals did not react, but in the end, in the end, only one man stood up to the idolaters. Only one man took the act personally. Only one man saw it as a denigration to his father, an insult to his king, and a blasphemous act of treason against his God. Only one man. However, the upside of the episode of the Golden Calf was that it showed the nation that though they may sin, they still have a loving Father in Heaven who is always willing and happy to forgive. In addition, if you look closely, you will always find that the end results of any punishment that God administers results in long-term benefits to His beloved children. God always prepares the cure before He brings the punishment. God's intent is never to punish. His intent is always to instruct. The decree that the children of Israel would journey through the desert for 40 years is attributed to the incident of the spies, a time when the men cried in their tents for nothing. However, there is a commentary that states that the seed for that transgression was planted at Mount Sinai when Moshe came down from the mountain on the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Tammuz when he broke the first tablets. So after punishing those who worshipped the calf on the next day, Moshe ascended the mount, mountains of Sinai for the second time, hoping to attain forgiveness for the people. This event connects to the seventh day of Tammuz, which is observed as a fast day even today, a day which begins a three-week period of mourning in commemoration of the destruction of both of our holy temples in Yerushalayim. Both were destroyed during this period of time in our history. Now, the incident of the golden calf revealed a deep-seated flaw that existed within the minds and hearts of the men of that generation. They had been born and brought up under the most oppressive of times and conditions, yet somehow they had managed to retain some connection to God Almighty and to their Jewish heritage. Nonetheless, they had fallen to the 49th level of impurity. Had they had fallen one more step, they would have entered the abyss and they would have been lost forever. So they forced God's hand, so to speak, and he redeemed them early, not after the 400 years that he had foretold to Abnavinu, Abraham our father, at the Brit Behapsarim, at the covenant between the parts. No, God redeemed them after only 210 years. Now, I find it coincidental that the number 210 corresponds to a premature birth, seven months. Seven is always a number that is connected with holiness in Judaism, beginning with the Shabbat, the seventh day of the week. Though they sinned, God's punishment to them was that of a benevolent father. They were sentenced to travel for 40 years, enveloped in a cloud, that miraculously carried them on their journeys in the desert. The Torah states that their shoes never wore out, which is logical, seeing that there was a cloud that rested under their feet, a sort of people mover. There was no necessity for them to walk or go. Their shoes never wore out. They were transported in a sealed environment, protected from the elements, the heat, the cold, the wind, and the sand. And though they lived in the desert, not one person over the 40-year period was ever bitten by a snake or a scorpion. That was until they complained in the last year of their journey, when God allowed nature to take its natural course. Then Moshe fashioned a copper snake with miraculous curative powers. If they were bitten by a snake or scorpion, they would look up at the snake and they would be healed. Imagine what the camp of the Israelites must have looked like. They were blessed with an abundance of water that flowed from the well of Miriam. That being the case, they would have been living on a picturesque lake, which would have promoted the growth of lush and beautiful gardens. They would have naturally been accompanied 
with all the varied aromatic scents and colors of nature. Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Not only did they merit to see Moshe himself, he was their teacher. This is why we refer to him as Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. We also read that not one man of the men of that generation who were sentenced to die in the desert died below the age of 60. Each year, on the anniversary of the day that they cried in their tents, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Og, all the men on whom the decree had fallen would go out to the desert and they would dig their own graves. They would spend that night lying in their graves. I would doubt that many, if any, could sleep. I would think that it would be more probable that they would spend the night reviewing all the actions that they had performed during the previous year. A night of reflection, a night of tshuva, of repentance. In the morning, Moshe would call out, let the living separate from the dead. Every year, some 15,000 plus men would die. This ritual continued until the, all the men of that generation that left Egypt, all 600,000 men, between the ages of 20 to 60, with the exception of Kaleb and Yoshua, had passed on. Only those who were 60 during that year would die each year. The rest would arise and walk away, leaving behind their sins, which they buried in their graves. To get some perspective to the number 60, in the year 1907 in the United States of America, the average lifespan of the American male was 47 years of age. I can assure you that most of those deaths were not easy. They didn't just dig their grave and go to sleep. In addition, the generation left Egypt were blessed. They were privileged to be able to watch and enjoy their children and grandchildren grow big and strong, both physically as well as spiritually. This was all done under the watchful eyes of Moshe and Aaron, a true sense of nachas, joy, to any loving parent. The knowledge that their children would achieve even greater successes than they had attained in their lifetime. So we see that their existence in the desert was a taste of Olam Haba, of the world to come. You know, there's a debate among the sages as to whether the generation of the desert has a portion in the world to come or not. I think that the fact that every year that they were compelled to dig their own graves and then spend that night in that grave hmm, must have helped them to earn their portion in the world to come. Can you imagine? If you spent the night in a grave that you dug yourself, what would you think about other than tshuva? repentance. This may well have been the greatest gift of all. A person who repents before their death with sincerity is never turned away. What would generate more feelings of repentance than a person <clears throat> lying in their grave for a night? There is a precept found in the book, Hebrew book of Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation, that teaches us that the beginning is always wedged in the end. If we look at the last verse in the Torah, the five books of Moshe, we read that the last three words which state, the Ene Kol Yisron, before the eyes of all of Israel. Now Rashi comments on these words and states, his heart inspired him, alluding to Moshe, to break the tablets in their sight. But Malkin of Breslov said that we end the reading of the Torah by recalling Moshe's act of breaking the tablets. And then we immediately begin to read the Torah again from the beginning in the portion of Bereshit with the description of God's creation of the world. So by breaking the tablets, Moshe invoked the kindness of God to forgive the people. And then that allowed them to start anew all over again. It is customary to end the Sefer Hebrew book on a positive note. That being the case, why would the Torah bring up the incident with the golden calf, which is seen is the most severe transgression committed by the nation. The Talmud in the Tractate of Avodah Zorah states that it was not within the character of the Jews to have made a golden calf. The Talmud states that God gave the Sutton, the devil, the power to cause them to sin. He did so in order to allow for teshuva, for repentance. 
God wanted them to reach the highest level possible, that of being a Baal Tshuva. So the Torah ends not with an allusion to sin, but rather with an allusion to tshuva, repentance, which atones for it. As it states in the Talmud, the Malkam, Shabali Tshuva Omdim, in a place where a truly repentant individual stands, even a truly righteous individual cannot aspire to. You know, we, we may think that miracles and godly revelations are what we need to serve God properly. Yet we witness <clears throat> that even with all of that, the nation in the desert was still able to make a golden calf. What they lacked was a deep and sincere connection to God and his Torah. They had not yet been privy to either. It was all still brand new and overwhelming for them. We, on the other hand, have had the benefit of being groomed throughout the ages. Let us hope that we have reached a point where we can muster the strength and fortitude to stand tall against the idol worship of the day. You know, the revelation that the nation experienced as they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai and received the Torah directly from God may be compared to a magnificent display of fireworks. This is in contrast to our daily revelations, which are at best only a candle in comparison. The fireworks display that they witnessed on Mount Sinai was otherworldly, breathtaking, but it was short-lived. Our candle, though it may be small and seemingly insignificant, burns bright and steady throughout the long, dark night of our extended exile. And with that, let us hope to herald in the coming of Mashiach Zakane quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. Uh, may God bless you with health and happiness and success, safety, all that is good. Again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you again for attending.